Acts 19 from verse 20 on. Now, I don't know if anyone here has traveled to Turkey and in particular to this part of Turkey, um, modern day Turkey, where uh, Ephesus is. In Ephesus, you can see these half pillars left in a muddy field. It doesn't look much, does it? But it used to be a massive, massive temple, incredibly big. It used to be one of the seven ancient wonders of the world, namely the, the te- great temple of Artemis. And it is central in the story we just read. So let's travel back in time, as it were, and see how um, this story developed, see what happened, and also why it is so helpful for us today. And as Drew already pointed out, this is the second time we look at the book of Acts in, in basically preparing for when we look at the letter that Paul later wrote to this church in Ephesus. But it's not as if we sort of rushed through the background. No, in these background stories itself have much to teach us. Paul was traveling, as I showed last week, was traveling around the, the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the nation of uh, modern-day Syria, and then into Turkey and into Greece. And he traveled around sharing the good news about Jesus Christ. And on his way then, in the year 53 or so, uh, some 20 years after Jesus died and rose, he came to this city, Ephesus, a massive city, one of the largest in the Roman Empire at the time. And we looked then last week at the beginnings of the church there, as Paul shared the gospel, as people understood the gospel and they learned about Jesus. Jesus Christ, who is God himself coming down to earth. Jesus, who lived the perfect life we should live. And yet he was killed on a cross. But he also rose again from the dead on the third day. He who was the substitute, taking the penalty we deserve. And for all then who follow him, who believe in him, as Lord and King, they can be forgiven and have their sins washed away like the, like the mist gone and be part of God's family forever. This Jesus is the Jesus Paul preached to the people. He is the Savior for every nation, not just the Jews. And even though Paul faced lots of opposition and hostility, many other people believed. And so the church there grew. As verse 20 says it, in this way the word of the Lord spread widely and it grew in power. People turned away from their sins. They made even that expensive bonfire, remember, where they burned all their magic scrolls showing, no, we don't want to have anything to do with this any longer. Now, let's see then what happens when the word of God spreads so widely in a town. So so we remember that riot. First thing to look at is when the gospel changes many lives. Let's see what happens when the gospel changes many lives. Now then in verse 21 to 23, we read a sort of a a change in the the way Luke tells the story. From now on, Paul sets his mind on Jerusalem to travel there and after that to Rome. But then in verse 23, Luke writes, about that time there arose a great disturbance about the way. This happened at the very end of some two or three years that Paul was in Ephesus. And maybe this event was even the the last final push that that um, made him leave the city. He couldn't stay there any longer. Well, what happened? Read on in verse 24. A silversmith named Demetrius, who made silver shrines of Artemis, brought in a lot of business for the craftsmen there. He called them together, along with the workers in related trades, and said... You know, my friends, that we receive a good income from this business. So imagine Demetrius being like this union leader, a a trade union leader. He was the guild leader for this group of silversmiths and other craftsmen. And they're in a really good business. They are leading a comfortable life. So wealthy and they are well off. Why? Well, basically because they're making religious souvenirs. Little temples, silver temples, replicas of that massive temple in their city. And people from all over the world flocked to Ephesus to to see this temple and to worship that statue of the goddess Artemis there. Later on in the story, in verse 35, that city clerk says, Doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? 
Now, this was, therefore, uh, it was a big thing. And as a consequence, great numbers of people came to visit the city and its temple. Uh, and I, I looked up an image of it just for you to see what it was like. And this is, this is an artist's rendering based on, on the data we have, the descriptions we have. It is massive. Look at the, the little figures of the people there. Columns some 60 feet high. A, a building four times the size of the current Parthenon that's still there in Athens. It was huge. No wonder it was one of the seven ancient wonders of the world. And, it, and it's really hard to describe then what an impact this had on the city. Think of, uh, maybe the easiest way to compare it is think of modern day Paris and how central the Eiffel Tower is. And how every souvenir shop sells little Eiffel Towers. Or think of London and going to see the Tower Bridge and how you can find postcards and little replicas of the Tower Bridge everywhere. Or maybe think of it in a, in a more religious context. Think of when Muslims travel to Mecca every year on their pilgrimage. And they walk around that building, the Kaaba, or however you pronounce it. Now, I don't know if they make replicas of that thing. But the point is the same. Think of how the people in Mecca all benefit from that religious tourism. The people who own the restaurants, the hotels, the souvenir shops. They all depend with their living on this building in their city. And in a, in a similar way then, this massive, massive temple with the statue of this goddess brought in this business for Demetrius and his colleagues. They made little replicas of it and they sold them to the many visitors. And this was really good business. But something had changed in the last two years. Read on in verse 26. Demetrius continues to, to talk to his colleagues. He says, and you see and hear how this fellow Paul has convinced and led astray large numbers of people here in Ephesus and in practically the whole province of Asia. He says that gods made by human hands are no gods at all. The gospel had come. As we saw last week, the gospel had come and it had changed many lives. It grew, spread widely, it grew in power. And so much so that sales started to go down for Demetrius and his friends. The people realized, wait a minute, if Artemis is no god at all, why do we need these silver temples? And you see here that the gospel is not some spiritual get out of jail free card. Just something you one time, oh yeah, pray the prayer, I'm a Christian now, all done, tick. No, gospel changes lives. Whole lives change so that people change the way they spend their money, change the, what they do and how they live their whole life. Now, see how Demetrius continues in verse 27. He tells the colleagues of the result of false preaching. There is danger that not only our trade will lose its goat name, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis will be discredited. And the goddess herself, who is worshipped throughout the province of Asia and the world, will be robbed of her divine majesty, as if that is possible with a true God. It all sounds very religious, this last bit of Demetrius' speech, but the way Luke said it in the previous verses, points out right, it was all about the money. It seems to be about his business. Follow the money, right? This is what makes Demetrius so upset. But it all shows us that the gospel has great power to change lives. Now, I, as I read this story, I thought of another more recent example of where the gospel changed many lives. Maybe you've heard of this story. It was the time of the Welsh revival in 1904. A massive change in society. One author tells how powerfully God was at work at the time. And how the people felt the presence of the Holy Spirit so clearly and were drawn to God. And he concludes then this, what were the results of this awakening? During the time of the revival, the police were left with virtually nothing to do and the courts were empty. Saloons and bars shut for lack of business. Public drunkenness was almost non-existent. All debts, many long forgotten, were paid in full. Travelling theatrical agencies cancelled their engagements as everybody was in church. Profanity disappeared, there was swearing and so on. It was said that horses everywhere were in complete confusion. They had become accustomed to responding to their master's profane shouts and kicks and cursing, virtually all of which had disappeared. So imagine even the donkeys and the horses in town are confused about the, the change in people's lives. That's the power of the gospel. When God works, as in Ephesus, as back then in South Wales mainly, 
But he can do that today. Let me ask you, has your life changed because of the gospel? Have our hearts seen that the power of the gospel, addressing the idols in our hearts and changing, challenging sinful habits, as it were, closing sinful businesses, as it were, in our hearts? Do you follow Jesus? Do you desire to be more like him? More holy, more godly, more full of the power of the Holy Spirit. and More of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And also, do you long to see Newark change so powerfully to, through the gospel? What will we see? What businesses here would be challenged, closing? Which things would change? If you think about that, maybe you long for the culture in Newark here or in, in this nation to change, but become more Christian again? Be, pre- be prepared though, because not everybody will be happy about that. Some businesses will suffer. So let's see what happened next in Ephesus. That's the second point. Let's respond wisely to opposition. Because next there in Ephesus, opposition arose. As Demetrius was giving this speech, his colleagues were getting outraged. They were shouting, greatest Artemis of the Ephesians. And the whole city got into an uproar. Opposition arose. And maybe you think, now wait, wait a minute, didn't we see that last week as well? Yes. And that is pretty much the case wherever Paul went with the gospel. All through the book of Acts we read of opposition arising. It's one of the major themes in this book. And the whole New Testament actually, that as the word of God spreads Also, opposition arises. People become hostile. Not everybody wants to hear this message. Now, the way in which Luke now tells the story here in Acts 19, what is different about this account is is maybe what you could call sort of the the massiveness of it. How how the whole city gets involved. You you can read in chapter 17 in Thessalonica of something similar, but there is just one sentence. Luke just says, yeah, the whole city got into a riot. But here he spends... Lots of time. The Holy Spirit inspired him to write down this whole story. So let's let's think about that element of the opposition in particular today. And note also how Luke emphasizes the, the irrationality of it. This sort of mob mentality that isn't thinking clearly. Read on in verse 28 with me. You will see it. When these colleagues, when these men heard this, they were furious, began shouting, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And soon the whole city was in an uproar. The people seized Gaius and Aristarchus, Paul's traveling companions from Macedonia, and all of them rushed into the theater together. Paul wanted to appear before the crowd, but the disciples wouldn't let him. Even some of the officials of the province, friends of Paul, sent him a message begging him not to venture into the theater. The assembly was in confusion. Some were shouting one thing, some another. Most people did not even know why they were there. It's somewhat humorous, isn't it? Imagine that. People all flock into the theatre and they, they're just shouting and they don't even know why they're there. That's what happens with mobs. People get caught up in it and they don't know why. And here Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen, therefore, they stir up the city. This riot starts. And the mob moved into that theatre. Now, if you think theatre, don't think of a cinema or the palace theatre here in the town centre. But think of this. This is the the, the remains of the theatre in Ephesus. Huge, huge amphitheatre. Like a stadium. Some 25,000 people could fit in it. So imagine being Gaius or Aristarchus there, being dragged by this mob into this place. And everybody shouting down at you. That is frightening, right? This is not just a small group of people. This is massive. And Paul himself is kept from going there too. His wise friends there in the church and and some leading officials in the town and in the province, um, they tell him, don't go there. You can't reason with this mob. They are not rational. You'll be lynched before you get to calm them down. Now, imagine how that uproar then would have impacted the Christians there in Ephesus, the people who would later receive Paul's letter. They had only come to believe this gospel maybe in the last two years or so. They were young Christians. And now their faith, the the way the gospel had led to this massive riot in the city, that, that would impact their lives. At work, they'd hear about it. 
Their neighbours would know, oh, you're, you're part of that group too, are you? Even though these people did not want to be rebels against the emperor, for example, they wanted to love neighbour. They wanted to live their Christian life. Gospel is such a, a countercultural message that has such power to change lives. Luke wants to prove to his readers, no, Christianity is not some illegal or rebellious or criminal thing. In, in the previous chapters, you can read of this. Maybe you, you remember at the end of Acts 16, when Paul and Silas had been thrown into prison, Paul at the end asks the city officials to lead them out of the city because they had been mistreated. And he wants for everybody to be clear, no, we didn't do anything wrong. Chapter 18, verse 5 describes, or uh, the first section describes similarly how this Roman official Gallio said, no, these people have done nothing wrong. That's, that Luke seeks to emphasize that. And here in, in Ephesus 2, the city clerk later says, verse 37, You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. They have done nothing wrong. Now just thinking about this section of the story and, and bringing it to our time, there's several things we can learn. I want to highlight a few we can learn from this part of the story. First, briefly, just look at verse 29. People seized Gaius and Aristarchus, friends of Paul, and they dragged them into the theater. So remember, you don't have to be the front man or the leader, the pastor, to get caught up in an outrage. Just as Gaius and Aristarchus were there, when the mob comes, they will just take anyone in their path. Next lesson, you may, you may not see a mob going around the city in a similar way here in Newark. But a similar sort of trial by the masses and public outrage is very real today, especially on the internet. Think of, think of the public shaming or, or the cancel culture going on. No fair trial can be expected. If you say or write one thing that the, the Demetriuses of this day don't like, you'll face the consequences. Your name will be all over the place. You won't be able to do this, speak there anymore. Thirdly, how, how should we go out then with this gospel that is so countercultural, that will change lives, and do that in a right kind of way, in a, in a, in a way that responds wisely also when opposition arises? There's a tension in this. On the one hand, we must be careful not to become rioters and rabble-rousers ourselves, inciting a mob, as it were. We must not on purpose be rude or obnoxious or, or criminal because then we would damage the name of Jesus and the name of the gospel. The city clerk very clearly said, no, they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. Paul hadn't gone into that temple and toppled the statue. He hadn't walked around the city insulting the name of Artemis. No, he had preached the gospel and that's a different thing. He preached Christ. So for us, for example, think however you might disagree with a book that you find somewhere. It's one thing to point that out. Talk with people about how the gospel confronts that. It's another thing to burn the book. Or if you disagree with someone, entering into discussion with them, polite, honest discussion, is one thing. But publicly mocking and insulting that person is something else, right? There's a, there's a, a way of going at this wisely. But on the other hand then, so there's, don't become a rebel rouser, but on the other hand, as we think how to respond, how to bring this gospel, maybe we're often too silent. Maybe we don't say enough. Maybe we are so key, uh, looking at to, to not become rabble rousers that we are too quiet. Especially in, in the society we live in today, which is so politically correct. And, and anything you say is, is seen as insulting or harmful. It's all about political correctness, right? About being kind to each other. Which, of course, means agreeing with them. I'm sure you've heard people around you say, well, it's all fine. Be a Christian as long as you don't impact my life. Keep it to yourself. Just don't let, make me want to change my life. Demetrius would have been fine with Paul's message if it hadn't impacted his business. So we are, we are pressured to keep silent about anything that might not be considered loving or anything that would sound harsh or anything that, that challenges people's lives. And people don't want to hear that. Just keep silent about it. But that's not what Paul did. That's not what Paul did. 
He kept sharing Christ, even though that was a message that did challenge people. Paul didn't quit. He shared Christ. But, but we, as the gospel then spreads, as we hope to see it spreading also in this town, also in inciting opposition, we must respond wisely. Think of how presenting Jesus as a loving, wise teacher is fine. But don't say he's the judge of the earth who will one day hold you to account for whatever you do. Think of how when we start sharing about God's beautiful designs for the family, for sexuality, for the value of life from the womb to the very oldest. We are no longer seen as loving and good then, but old fashioned and restrictive. So if we out of love for neighbors seek to share about those things, share those truths from the Bible... Seek life and health and blessing. We won't be seen as loving but as hateful or oppressive. Someone discerningly said about our time. When loving means only affirming and and celebrating. He said we are commanded in the Bible to love our neighbor. But today that isn't the same as make them feel loved. Because sometimes that isn't the case. We are commanded to love our neighbor but not to make them feel loved. Indeed, as we, as we share the good news that will bring sin to light and it will impact the businesses of temple makers, however that sh- is, is shaped in our day, it will confront idolatry in our hearts. It will expose the lies and reveal the truth. We must not be afraid to let the gospel upset this status quo in our country. But there's a tension there, right? You feel it. You, Don't become a a riot or a rabble rouser. But equally, don't let the truth of the gospel go silent. And that tension, we find it in some other texts as well. Jesus said, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. And Paul later wrote to the Ephesians, speak the truth in love. Don't let it all be about love at, at the cost of the truth. But don't be such a sort of a truth warrior that you forget to love people. In the way you speak. And there's a tension there. And we need prayer and God's guidance to to see situation by situation. What is a wise way of responding? And more briefly then a final lesson from this part of the story. Is that others might try to distance themselves from us. That seems to be what's going on in verse 33 and 34. Maybe let's read those again. Verse 33. The Jews in the crowd pushed Alexander to the front. And they shouted instructions to him. And he motioned for silence and tried in order to make a defense before the people. But when they realized he was a Jew, they all shouted in unison for about two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. It seems here that the Jews feared to be grouped with this new Jewish sect as Christianity was seen. And the Jews, they had this really special position in the Roman Empire. They had all sorts of privileges. And they thought now, oh, we don't want to be grouped with Paul and these older people because we will lose our, our privileges. Let's, let's push a spokesperson forward. Let's make sure don't, we're not like them. Please keep, keep liking us. We are not like them. We are okay. And I just thought of some liberal churches today who, who reject the Bible and do the same thing. They want to stay relevant, want to stay liked. And no, we're not fundamentalists like them. Please, we are totally up to date with you all. And the truth of the Bible is gone if that happens. Well, that doesn't work. As for them back in Ephesus, the mort mentality just takes over. Verse 34, the people shout the man down for two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And only after that time, when it finally starts to cool down a bit, as it were, that city clerk is able to reason with them, calm them. Now let's finally then see that God used that high government official in the city to protect his people. God, in all of this, was in control. Remember then, as we see the gospel changing lives and and respond wisely to opposition, remember, in all of it, God is in control. That city clerk wasn't a Christian probably, but he didn't know how to get the people calm again. Let's read this part of the story, verse 35 and following. 
The city clerk quieted the crowd and said, Fellow Ephesians, doesn't all the world know that the city of Ephesus is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of her image which fell from heaven? Therefore, since these facts are undeniable, <clears throat> you ought to calm down and not do anything rash. You have brought these men here, though they have neither robbed temples nor blasphemed our goddess. If then Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a grievance against anybody, the courts are open and there are proconsuls, those who are Roman officials, they can press charges. If there's anything further you want to bring up, it must be settled in a legal assembly. As it were, we are in danger of being charged with rioting because of what happened today. In that case, we would not be able to account for this commotion since there is no reason for it. And after he had said this, he dismissed the assembly. So this man first calms them down by affirming what they've been shouting for two hours. So don't worry about the greatness of your goddess. Doesn't all the world know that she is the great goddess? That's all right. And <clears throat> then he argues that Paul and his companions haven't committed a crime. There's nothing, if, if there's anything between them and, and those silversmiths, let them settle it in a proper context in the courts. Instead, they, this whole assembly here is, is in danger of being criminal. They are seemingly rioting. And if there was one thing that the Romans didn't like, it was rebellion and rioting. That will be push, um, push, punished and pushed down severely. But in all of this, we see that God is in control. And he used this man to help and protect the Ephesian Christians, including Gaius and Aristarchus, who, who got out safely. Maybe they were the ones who in so much detail could tell Luke how this all happened. And we today too, we can seek justice and righteousness in the laws and in the government of this nation. Even though it isn't Christian, just like the Roman Empire in Paul's day. But the government has been put there by God to protect good, to punish evil. So maybe as an example, perhaps you've heard of the law cases in recent years where Christians were helped by the Christian Institute or other such organizations and they were um, helped to defend themselves against accusations of discrimination or hate speech. So think of the cake bakers or the street preachers or the school teachers and others who have been cleared of charges because of such efforts. Just like Paul and his companions were cleared of the charges so long ago. And what a blessing that this is still possible. It is worth the effort to, to fight for righteous laws in this land and to oppose bad laws. And it's good to support organizations that, that work in that area. But see then also the contrast, as we draw to a close, the, the contrast between our God, the one true living God who is in control in contrast with all those false gods, those idols. That's so clear in this story. Because in stark contrast with the idol Artemis, our God is actually in control. And he was powerfully at work and still is today. In verse 27, Demetrius fears, honestly or not, that their goddess would be robbed of her divine majesty. As if that's possible for a true God. Demetrius and his colleagues made little temples, maybe little replicas of the statue itself. And that's what they worshipped. Powerless, helpless statues, as we thought about with the kids. And think of all the endless shouting. The greatest Artemis of the Ephesians, like some mantra. Two hours long, they just shout and shout and shout the same thing, like some mantra. Luke doesn't really describe it as if the people were giving honour and praise to the, the goddess at the time. It, it sounds more like some desperate attempt to convince everybody of the truth of that statement. If we just shout louder, perhaps they will believe it too. It reminds me of the, the story in the Old Testament with the prophet Elijah and the Baal prophets. How they also for a whole day shouted and pleaded and danced and did everything they could to get attention from this fake God. Until it was enough for Elijah. And he prayed down fire from heaven. And all the people fell on their faces. And said, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Therefore, see, our God, the one true living God who is in control, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God who, who changed all those lives in that city so that Demetrius almost went out of business. 
God directed all these events. He is in control over it all. And he saved Paul and his friends again. And he made sure that they could keep going to share this gospel. And it came here in the UK and it reached you and me too. Verse 20. In this way the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. And then some six to eight years later, as these Christians received Paul's letter, the church was still there and it was flourishing. In Asia, in, in all of the province, Asia and Ephesus. And in that letter, Paul prayed that the Ephesians might know more and more God's incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. My brothers and sisters, that God is still alive, and he rules, and he's in control, and he exerts that same power in, over the world today. He will succeed in unfolding his plan. He will stop all those who oppose him, even Satan, in the end, they will fail. And this gospel message that Paul then proclaimed is still the message we have today and we can share today with those around us. This good news can change many lives as it has changed yours and mine. Bringing people from death to life through Jesus. And let's therefore not be afraid to upset the status quo in this nation and here in Fernwood and in Newark. Let's share that news boldly and respond wisely in case opposition arises. Amen. Now, instead of shouting greatest Artemis of the Ephesians, I thought let's finish by singing fervently, great is the gospel of our glory.